Shalom Aleichem. Peace to you. Thank you for watching. This video is going to talk about appearances of Yahweh in the Torah and it's going to talk about why I believe that those appearances of Yahweh in the Torah give weight to a Trinitarian uh, understanding of who Yahweh is and don't really line up with a Unitarian understanding of Yahweh, which is that Yahweh is only a single person as opposed to being more than a single person. In Trinitarianism, uh, our understanding is that Yahweh is, uh, there are three who are Yahweh, the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, and that the three are one, Echad. Uh, so what I wanna do, I wanna look at some of these appearances, and what I wanna ask you is, that. Uh, to, to see which one of those two understandings makes better sense of these occasions, these, these stories that we're looking at, these events. And in particular, I want you to consider what do the people, the protagonists, think is happening in these events? Do the protagonists, so Hagar, Jacob or Jacob and Moses, Moshe, do they think that they are seeing and interacting with the Most High Yahweh or do they think that they're seeing and interacting with some other person? That who is not Yahweh? That's the question. So, Genesis, Bereshit, chapter sixteen, verse seven. This is uh, this is the story. One of the uh, occasions where Hagar is treated badly by Sarai. She's just been. She's just become. She's just conceived a child, Hagar, and Sarah has got uh, jealous and basically forced her out. The story continues, verse seven. And the messenger of Yahweh found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Now, just to stop there, the word that's translated there as messenger is the Hebrew word. Uh, it's Strong's number H4397. And the, the term is malak. And the definitions here that we see in the Brown, Driver and Briggs dictionary is threefold. One, messenger, which could be a human messenger. Two, or one B, an angel. So we're talking about those that category of being that is not human. But that is not God. That is not Elohim. So we're talking Gabriel, Mikael, and so forth, Raphael, and so forth. And then the third definition there is a theophanic angel. So theoph a theophany is an appearance of God. Theos and uh, it's like I think it's derived from the Greek word for face, panim. I think or pan. But anyway, a theophany is 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 a, an an appearance of God. And so a theophanic angel is an angel who is who is God, let's just say. So let's have a look and see what's happening in this uh, in this portion of scripture. And the reason I'm reading here from this version, which is the scriptures, is that they don't they translate the term malak as messenger. They don't translate it into angel because the problem with English in in English, angel only means those you know the Gabriel, Mikael, and so forth. Whereas the word messenger is more in keeping with what the Hebrew word malak actually means. It doesn't it doesn't put that thought into your head straight away that oh this is a you know an angel with the wings kind of thing. And verse eight, the this uh, messenger said, Hagar, Sarah's female servant, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of Sarah, my mistress. And the messenger of Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and humble yourself under her hand. And the messenger of Yahweh said to her, I'm going to increase your seed greatly, too numerous to be counted. And the messenger of Yahweh said to her, see, you are conceiving and bearing a son and you shall, and shall call his name Yishmael because Yahweh has heard your affliction. And he is to be a wild man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him and dwell over it and against his brother. So the messenger stops talking. So notice there all the way through there, the messenger of Yahweh, messenger, messenger of Yahweh said this, messenger of Yahweh said that. And then in verse 13, it says that she called the name of Yahweh. She, she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. You are the L that sees for she said, even here, have I seen after him who sees me? Now, hello. Who, who have you seen, Hagar? Who does, who does Hagar think that she has seen? Read it again. She called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. You are the El who sees. And she says, even here, I have seen him who sees me. Who has she seen? She has seen Yahweh. She thinks she has seen Yahweh. 
Unitarians will say, no, no, no. Or some Unitarians will say, no, 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 no. She just saw the messenger who's representing Yahweh. But she doesn't seem to think that. And what what Unitarians will say is that, uh, you see, it's a very it's a very Hebraic understanding, you see, uh, this concept of shaliach, which is the, 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 the concept of being a sent one, an apostle, uh, you know, a, a representative. It's a very Hebraic understanding. And so we can't understand it in our Western mindsets. Well, I'll say, first of all, that Hagar was closer, much closer to a Hebraic mindset than we are. <laughs> you know, she was she was married to the first Hebrew, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham was a Hebrew. And so she didn't say, oh, I've, I've just seen uh, a shaliach of Yahweh. She says, no, I've seen Yahweh. I've seen him who sees me. So that's the first example. Uh, let's carry on. There's a, shall I look at the, yeah, let's look at the other. There's another example involving uh, Hagar again. Uh, and this is in chapter 22. And we'll go from verse 11. And again, she basically on this instance. Uh, oh no, sorry, this isn't this isn't Hagar. This is uh, where are we? This is um, this is Abraham. This is the famous. Uh, what's the word they call it in Hebrew? This is the famous uh, almost offering of Yishak, where where Abraham takes Yishak up to the mountain as commanded, and he's going to uh, you know do a pretty unthinkable thing to him. And so let's read from verse 10. It says uh, that is to slay him, to slaughter him. So from chapter 22, verse 10, it says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the messenger of Yahweh called out to him from the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay, a ha do not lay your hand on your boy, nor touch him. For now I know that you fear Elohim, seeing that you... You have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Hello, from me. So the messenger of Yahweh, again, is talking. He says, I, I see and I know now that you fear Elohim, that's God, you fear God, and you haven't withheld your only son from me, he says. The messenger says, you, Abraham hasn't held his son from me. You, Abraham, haven't held your, withheld your son from me. In other words, the messenger here appears to be calling himself Elohim, saying that you, now that I know that you fear Elohim, i.e. me, and that you have not withheld your only son from me. So that's another occasion where, you know, uh, well, the, the, on this occasion, it's where the, 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 the messenger himself is claiming to be, uh, apparently claiming to be Yahweh. Now we have a, a series of of of, uh, of interactions between uh, Yahweh. I'm saying between Yahweh and Israel or Jacob, and we'll start in Genesis chapter twenty-eight, verse uh, eleven. Or well, I can read from verse ten. It says, "And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran." I think that is. And he came upon a place and stopped over for the night, for the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and he put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Sounds uncomfortable. Verse 12. And he dreamed and saw a ladder set up on the earth and its top reached to the heavens and saw messengers of Elohim going up and coming down on it. And see, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, Elohim of Abraham, your father, and the Elohim of Yishak. The land on which you are lying, I give it to you and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall break forth to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And all the clans of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your seed. And see, I am with you, and I shall guard you wherever you go, and you shall and shall bring you back to this land, for I'm not going to leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And Jacob awoke from his from his sleep and said, Truly Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of Elohim, and this is the gate of the heavens. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a standing column, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the, play, the name of that place Bethel. However, the name of that city had previously been Luz. So, 
couple of things to say here. First of all, we see the gospel being preached, the good news being preached again to to Jacob as it was preached to Abraham, which is that in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the clans of the earth shall be blessed. So that's that's a that's the gospel there. But um, the more importantly, the point is that Yahweh stood above it and says, "I am Yahweh, the, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob." You know, and so forth. And then um, uh, Jacob wakes up and said, "Oh my goodness me! I saw you know Yahweh was in this place, and I didn't even know." Then we go to to chapter thirty one and. Uh, Jacob actually refers back to this incident and gives a bit more of an understanding of what he thinks. Oh, no, the, the, the messenger, a messenger, uh, this messenger of Elohim, messenger of Yah, appears and says something. He says this, uh, And the messenger of Elohim spoke to me, that is Yahweh, spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks, are streaked, speckled, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the El of Bethel, where you anointed the standing column and where you made a vow to me. Now rise up, get out of this land, and return to the land of your relatives. So, the messenger of Elohim, the messenger of, of Yah here, says that he is the El, the God who appeared to him in Bethel. And remember, Yahweh appeared from uh, appeared to him in Bethel. So Yahweh, the messenger of Yah of Elohim, is Yahweh. He is Elohim. He is the the El of Bethel. He is the God of Bethel who appeared to him uh, in that vision. He claims. And then again, we have another reference back. I think yeah, I think that is this the best place to go. Genesis, Bereshit forty eight. Uh, let's have a look. Or maybe, yeah, let's go to Genesis 48, verse 14, where we read. So this is right at the end of uh, Jacob or Israel's life, and he's blessing his children, basically. Uh, actually, he's, bless he's blessing his grandchildren at this stage, uh, the children of Yosef. And he says, and the, the, the scripture says, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, Manasseh's, Manasseh's head, consciously directing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Yosef and said, The Elohim before whom my fathers Abraham and Yishak walked, the Elohim who has fed me all my life long to this day, the messenger who has redeemed me from all evil, Bless the youths and let my name be called upon them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Yishak and let them increase to a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now hold on a second. All these years later on, as as uh, Jacob or Israel is referring back to that appearance, he says, he says the Elohim of my fathers is the messenger who redeemed him from all evil. Again, in Jacob's understanding, in, in Israel's understanding, that messenger was Yahweh, was Elohim, was the Elohim of Abraham and Yishak. Okay? Now we go back a bit. We don't, I just want to return back to something that happened earlier in Jacob's, Jacob's life. And this, I think this is significant that all of these things are happening in the life of Jacob because Jacob, of course, is Israel. Israel is his name that's his Yahweh changed his name to Israel in this inst instance that I'm going to read here and so it's almost like the Most High was trying to get it across very clearly to the children of Israel who would be reading this that look who I am this is who I am understand who I am so let me read this yeah this is a uh, where are we uh, Bereshit 32 verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not overcome him, that is when the man saw that he didn't overcome Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he said, that is, the man said, let me go for the day breaks. But, he, but uh, Jacob replies, I'm not letting you go until you've blessed me. So he asked him, 
what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he, and he the angel, no, sorry, not the angel, the man said, your name is no longer Jacob, but Yisrael, because you have striven with Elohim and with men and you have overcome. And the footnote there explains that Yisrael means to strive with El, to overcome with El, to rule with El. Uh, verse 29, and Jacob asked him saying, please let me know your name. And he said, why do you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And now look at this. And verse, I mean, this is inter so interesting anyway, but verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen Elohim face to face and my life is preserved. So this is really up the ante because this man who he was struggling with said, actually, I'm Elohim. This is who you're, you're struggling with. I'm Elohim. And then Jacob's like, oh my goodness me, I have seen Elohim face to face and I'm alive. What would he say that if he thought he was just struggling with some angel? No, there's no precedent for people not being able to look at angels you know the, the divine angels if you want the michaels and the raphaels and the Mikhail, the uh, gabriels there's no precedent for that in the scriptures about not being able to look at um, them but there's a lot of references in the scriptures which i'll talk about later about not being able to look at yahweh and live so again he understood that this uh, this on this occasion that he was actually interacting with the very elohim of his fathers now, later on, much later on in uh, down the centuries, we go to the prophet Hosea uh, and he refers back to this in a sort of poetic kind of way. But he, he adds a little bit more of an understanding. This is in Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 to 4. He says, uh, oh, I'll start from verse two, 12, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Yahweh has a controversy with Yehuda or Judah to punish Jacob according to his ways, to repay him according to his deeds. And he, that is Jacob, took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he strove with Elohim, that is, when he was wrestling with him. And verse 4, he strove with the messenger and overcame. He wept and sought favour. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. Even Yahweh, Elohim of hosts, Yahweh is his remembrance. Now, What's Hosea saying here? He's, Hosea has shown that he understands that in that incident that took place, the wrestling incident, the man who Jacob was, with, was wrestling with was actually a messenger, a messenger, and was actually Elohim. Elohim, Yahweh, Elohim of hosts. He strove, look, it says, in his strength, he strove with Elohim, that's God. He strove with the messenger. And he found him in Bethel again, connecting the wrestling with the uh, the whole dream and the Jacob's ladder, so called. Connecting those two incidents, saying that's the same entity, the same person, the same being that appeared to him, that wrestled with him, that blessed him. That is Yahweh, Elohim of hosts. Yahweh is his remembrance, or Yahweh is, is his name. So again, what was Hosea thinking? Was Hosea thinking, oh no, no, no? And you know, this is now deep into Hebraic. Hebraic times, you know, you know, Israelite times, did he not understand the whole concept of Shaliach? Did he not understand that? No, no, you, you silly Westerner, Hosea. That wasn't Yahweh that he was wrestling with. That was uh, just some other entity that represented Yahweh. Or did, did he understand, did Hosea understand that that was actually Elohim? That that was the messenger, the Malak, Malak of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh, who he himself is actually Yahweh and is Elohim of hosts all right i'm gonna i'm not gonna look at i'm only gonna look at a couple more because you know this point could be made over and over and over again but i'm going to focus now on two occasions where moshe the great giver of torah where he encounters this being and i think it's the same being actually i think it's yeshua if i'm honest uh, that i think this is the logos before he was incarnated in the womb of Miriam and became uh, Yehoshua or Yehoshua Jesus he was the Logos in the beginning was the Logos the Logos with, was with Elohim the Logos was Elohim and so let's have a look let, let me let me build up the case for that uh, to, to continue to build the case again we're, we're trying to understand 
whether you know the exit whether um Moshe thinks that he's seeing just some entity some you know Gabriel or Mikael type entity or if he thinks he's seeing and interacting with actual Yahweh let's have a look verse one and Moshe was shepherding the flock of Yephro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he came to the flock he came he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to Horeb in the mountain of Elohim and the messenger of Yahweh Oh, here we go. That's the same messenger of Yahweh, presumably, who appeared to uh, Hagar and and Abraham. The, the messenger of Yahweh appeared to him and said, it, sorry, in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, this Moshe looked and saw the bush burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, oh, let me let me turn aside and uh, now and, and see this great sight. Why is this bush not burning? And Yahweh saw that he had turned aside to see, and Elohim called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is set apart or holy ground. I am the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yishak, and the Elohim of Jacob. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look at Elohim. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. Let me let me let's 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 just break it down a little bit. So first of all, verse two. Well, verse one. They're on the mountain of Elohim, Horeb, and then the messenger of Yahweh appeared to Moshe from inside the midst of the fire. Yeah, and then Yahweh saw that Moshe had turned to look and Elohim called out to him from the midst of the bush. So who's in the midst of the bush? The messenger of Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, all one and the same person. This messenger is Elohim. This messenger is Yahweh. So much so, that's so clear and so much so that he says, take your sandals off your feet. This place is holy ground. That's a trademark saying for you know Yahweh to be talking and then in verse 7 sorry verse 6 he says this this messenger of Yahweh this uh, this Elohim Yahweh says I am the Elohim of your fathers the Elohim of Abraham of of Yishak of Jacob and what does Moshe do what does Moses do does he say oh right it's just a, it's just an angel it's fine it's only an angel being, who's been sent by Yahweh no he doesn't he says, Moshe hid his face for he was afraid to look at Elohim. Why was he afraid to look at Elohim? Well, we'll find out why he was afraid to look at Elohim. But he obviously had the same understanding as uh, as his uh, forefather, Jacob, Jacob did, Israel did, which is that what I've seen Elohim and I'm still alive. He's got that same understanding that that's not something that you do, <laughs> you know. And let me just say, let me just say this. From a Trinitarian perspective, this is this is this is quite easy to reconcile. What well, what's happening here is that uh, they're not seeing the Father, they're not seeing the Father, God the Father, but they are seeing the Word, the Logos, the Son. They are seeing the Logos, who is Yahweh, who is Elohim, who appears over and over again to various uh, patriarchs in the Scriptures, but the Father never appears. But the Son is. Elohim, the Son is Yahweh, the Son is the Elohim of the Father still. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then verse 7, And then Yahweh said, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people who are in Mizraim, and I have heard their cry because of their slave drivers, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Mizraites, and to bring them up from the... and so on and so on and so forth. For basically... Um, you know, we know what's happening. This is where Yahweh comes and starts to announce what happens you know a, a short while later which is the passover which we've just marked uh, here in april 2019 the pesach passover and matzah unleavened bread which i think is finishing today or maybe yesterday's finished this is what what's being announced here basically and then we go to the next chapter we go to chapter four uh, the first few verses it says and moshe answered and said and if they do not believe me nor listen to my voice and say Yahweh has not appeared to you be saying well what should I do if they don't believe me because he's got to go and convince them that Yahweh has appeared to them 
to appear means to make yourself visibly seen. Oh, well, that's, that's the normal, the usual understanding of that word. And Yahweh said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, throw it to the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moshe fled from it. And he says, and then Yahweh said to Moshe, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and took hold of it and it became a rod in his hand. So that, this is Yahweh speaking, so that they will believe that Yahweh, Elohim of, your, of their fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, of Yishak and of Jacob has appeared to you. He gives another sign as well but the point is just to that's really just to underscore that this messenger of Yahweh this Elohim is claiming to appear to Moshe and he's saying look go and tell the people that I have appeared to you and by I I mean the Yahweh of the, the Elohim of your fathers is who's appearing to you again it's without introducing all kinds of uh, concepts to try and work around it it's pl it's the plain meaning the plain understanding here is that Yahweh is visibly appearing to Moshe and that he's given him these signs so that he can he can prove to <laughs> prove to his brethren that it's Yahweh who is appearing to Moshe you know from a Unitarian perspective again this is a little bit difficult particularly for those who keep going on about this Shaliyah concept it's difficult for me to, to to say well no it's not Yahweh who's appearing here it's not Yahweh Elohim who's, who's speaking here no no it's not it's actually just Gabriel or whatever some other angel angel it's to me that's it's doing damage to these scriptures frankly and and my point again is I don't know if I said this before but the Trinity or I mean some people are binitarians they believe in the father and the son but not the spirit they don't think the spirit's a person but you know I'm a Trinitarian and it's, it's not an easy concept to grasp it's it's a tough concept to grasp it's a tough tough concept to explain definitely but it's the concept that makes the best use of the scriptures is is my point really and that's that's what we have to do you either jettison the scriptures or you just deal with what the scriptures tell you and you come up with an under or you you frame your understanding around the actual scriptures themselves and for me unitarianism doesn't doesn't work with all of these scriptures one more I'm going to read, just a couple of a couple of verses from Exodus chapter 24. Or actually, there's a few verses from Exodus 24. Um, and also from Exodus 33. Basically, all over the Torah, there is all the, there's, this is taking place. I would I would I would go as far to say that the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, finds almost well, it's it's more in a way, it's more visible in the Torah, the first, even even just in the first two books. Of the Torah, Genesis and Exodus, than it is in the entire New Testament, if you're willing to just let the text speak for themselves. So, Exodus chapter 24, this is a such a magnificent uh, event here. You know, when I was reading this and meditating on it, this is magnificent. And this is where, you know, just before uh, the, the people are going to get the 10 words, the 10 commandments. So, first of all, verses 1 and 2. And Moshe said, uh, sorry, to Moshe, he said, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aharon, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy elders of Israel, and you shall bow yourselves from a distance. But Moshe shall draw near to Yahweh by himself, and let him not draw near, not, let them not draw near, nor let the people go up with them. Now, what just to, as, a, as an aside, uh, amongst the in the in the intertestamental period, in the second temple period, the Israelite sages had a lot of a uh, concerns over this passage because they read it as um that you know Yahweh speaking and he says come up to Yahweh and and they read it as actually let's have a look at some of the other other translations see if it's yeah some of the other translations say go up but the, the idea the, 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 the problem for them was that it seems to be one Yahweh saying go up come up to another Yahweh why is Yahweh talking about himself in the third person so they this is where some of the understandings of the multiplicity of personhood in Yahweh kind of you know found their root but I'll talk about that in another video but the point is that Yahweh is telling the people to, some of the people Yahweh, um, Moshe and uh, Aharon and two of his sons and also uh, the 70 elders to come up and then we go down to verse 9 and we see what happens it says and Moshe went up, and also Aharon and Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. 
And then look what happened here. Hello. No man shall, sh no man shall, sh shall see Yahweh and live. Oh, what's this? And they saw the Elohim of Israel. They saw who? Did they see uh, just a messenger? Did they see? No. They saw the Elohim of Israel, and under his feet, like a paved work of sapphire stone, and like the heavens for brightness. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Israel. They saw Elohim and they ate and drank. Now that's deep. That is deep on so many levels. I find that fascinating, first of all, that it says they saw him, they saw Elohim, and describes what he looked like, what Elohim looked like. And then it says, but Yahweh didn't destroy them despite them seeing him. Again, it's that understanding of if you see Elohim, if you see Yahweh, you will be destroyed. You will die. That was what Hagar was worried about. That is what Jacob was worried about. That is what um, uh, Moshe was initially worried about. And it says here, no, but they didn't, they didn't die. And not only that, they sat down and they ate and drank. They saw Elohim, they sat down and ate and drank. And that's what I love about that is that this concept of when you like fellow, being in the presence of Yahweh, being in the presence of God and eating, it's just quite, it seems such a mundane and like, oh, what? What do you mean you eat and drink? Surely you just worship and praise and, you know, I don't know, put on sackcloth and ashes and say, woe is me, I'm not worthy. <laughs> but, um, but they ate and drank. And it, it makes me think of going back to another appearance of Yahweh when, when, um, when Abraham saw Yahweh, Yahweh appeared to Abraham. This is in uh, Genesis chapter 18, I think it is. Let's just go to it. Yeah. And Yahweh appeared to him by the ter to the terebinth trees of Mamre while he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And then, but let's read it. It says, so he lifted up his eyes and looked and saw three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, Yahweh, if I have found favour in your eyes, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And let me bring a piece of bread and refresh your hearts and then go on. For this is why you've, you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. <laughs> um, and so it's like, why are you thinking of just eating when, when, when Yahweh turns up? That, it seems a bit sort of trivial doesn't it but apparently apparently not eating is what you do when you're in the presence of Yahweh just like of course the supper the master's supper you know when we meet as believers we should eat bread and drink wine in remembrance of what Yeshua did for us you know he gave his body and his blood of the new covenant so there's this thing about eating in the presence of Yahweh which is uh you know the, the done thing to do but the, anyway back to the point here is that they didn't die they saw Elohim they didn't die again did they see Elohim or did they see some other entity that was representing Elohim no they saw Elohim and if it wasn't Elohim why is Moses saying it was Elohim Moses apparently wrote Exodus so what's he, why is he saying that they saw Elohim now this I'm going to throw this this in because I think this is kind of interesting as well because look it says and Yahweh said to Moshe, remember, they've all just seen Mo, uh, Yah, uh, Elohim. They've seen him, the, the Elohim of Israel, and they didn't die. But then Yahweh says to Moshe, come up to me on the mountain and be there while I give you tablets of stone and the Torah and the command which I have written to teach them. And Moshe arose with his servant Yehoshua. And Moshe went up to the mountain of Elohim. So now the, the elders and, and Aaron and that are staying where they were, where they saw Elohim. But Moshe is ascending even higher up into the Mount Horeb. And he said to the elders, wait for us here until I come back to you and see Aharon and... What's that? Uh, sorry, I just need to check that. Aharon and Hur, Hur, Hur are with you. Whoever has matters, let them go to them. So he's leaving them in charge. And we know that went terribly wrong because they ended up uh, fashioning a calf uh, and uh, worshipping it. But um, verse 15, Moshe went up to the mountain, into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the esteem or the glory of Yahweh dwelt on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the esteem or the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. 
And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and went up to the mountain. And it came to be that Moshe was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So what I'm saying here now is that they've already seen Elohim, but now Moshe has gone even higher up into the mountain. And it doesn't say that he's seen Elohim, but it's saying that the glory come of, of Yahweh comes and dwells and so forth. And he's surrounded there and he, six days is preparing and so forth. I would argue that this is now the father. This is the father there who is now in, in you know, a pit, or speaking to or about to speak to, to um to to Moshe. Whereas before it was the logos, you know, and, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, "Speak to the children of Israel," so on and so forth. Da, da, da. And then we go to verse thirty, chapter thirty three, and this is where the whole idea of no one will see Yahweh and live. This is kind of where that comes from the first place that we see it explicitly stated although the previous times we know that the, the people knew it and they understood that to be the case that you don't you don't generally see Yahweh and live but here is where it's stated clear and it's just another amazing amazing portion of scripture amazing event imagine being there and seeing this Moshe said to Yahweh see you are saying to me bring up this people but you have not made known to me whom you would send me Sorry, you have not made known to me whom you would send with me, though you have said, I know you by name and you and you have also found favor in my eyes. And now, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, please show me your way. Let me know you that I may so that I may find favor in your eyes. I consider that this nation is your people. So, so, so Moses, Moshe is, is, is seeking a great a connection with Yahweh at this point and he replies Yahweh replies my presence does go and I shall give you rest and he says to him if your presence is not going do not lead us up from here and that is a great attitude isn't it I wish I would have that attitude more in my life I hopefully will have that attitude which is that you know if Yah's not in it don't do it just don't go and he said to him if your presence, sorry, yeah, if your presence is not going, do not lead us up from, from here. For how then shall it be known that I have found favour in your eyes? I and your people, except you go with us. Then we shall be distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh said to Moshe, even this word you have spoken, I shall do. For you have found favour in my eyes, and I know you by name. And then Moshe said, Please show me your glory. In other translations, it's glory, but esteem is used here in the scriptures. And he said, he was, this is Yahweh said, I shall cause all my goodness to pass before you, and I shall proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I shall favor him whom I favor, and I shall have compassion on him whom I have compassion. But he said, you are unable to see my face for no man does see me and live and there you go he says it plainly Yahweh is saying here no one can see me and live no man can see me and live it's just not going to happen Moshe I'm sorry but he's saying that he was he will proclaim his glory and proclaim his name and so forth and Yahweh said see there is a place with me and you shall stand on the rock and it shall be while my esteem, my glory passes by that I shall put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I shall take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you will not see. So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? A back? Yahweh has a back and a face? I mean, I, I did meet a pastor in the church I used to go to, you know, who was convinced that, you know, the father has a body. Now, I don't know. Um, but the point here is that uh, I think this is clearly the father who is speaking here. And he's saying that no one shall see me and live. But we know from all the previous scriptures we saw just there with Moshe and Nadab and Abihu and Aharon and 70 elders. And then with uh, Jacob and uh, with with Abraham a couple of times and then with um, with Hagar over and over and over and over again. Elohim, Yahweh, the messenger, is appearing to people and they're living, even though they're thinking, oh, I'm going to die because I've just seen Elohim. 
So, so in a Trinitarian understanding, it makes sense. All of those appearances were not the Father. All of those appearances were the Logos, were the second person of the Trinity, as, as he's called. Now, I want to show you a few a few portions in Scripture where uh, where we do we, we we see it said that in the New Testament this is that that because some some people might say well yeah you see these these Christians these New Test in the New Testament they kind of just uh, ignored all this stuff about you can't see Yahweh and, and and so forth and they they basically created a god in uh, in uh, Yeshua but Yeshua himself makes it very plain that no one can see. Yahweh, or the the, the 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 New Testament makes it clear that no one can see him. First of all, I think it's in Yohanan, John chapter one. Where is it? Yeah, here we go. Yohanan chapter one, verse eighteen. No one has ever seen Elohim, the only brought forth forth Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He did declare him. So no, this is this is Yohanan speaking. But he's saying no one has seen Elohim ever seen Elohim, and then is a good one actually. Oh, that's good. It gives you the the cross references. Yeshua himself says in chapter five verse thirty seven, the Father who sent me, he bore witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Now to be fair, this isn't a good reference because I think he's talking to the Yehudim. He's specifically talking to them, saying you haven't seen uh, Elohim, but yeah so we'll, we'll leave that one uh yeah here's a better one Yohanan chapter 6 verse 46 this is Yohanan, uh, Ye Yehoshua talking again he says not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from Elohim he has seen the father so what's going on well Yeshua's talking about himself he's saying I've seen the father but no one else has ever seen the father and that matches with what, what we've seen previously that yeah no one saw the father because the father himself says said in uh, in Exodus chapter 33 no one shall see him and live but Yeshua now is saying well I've seen him well how does that how does that work well he's seen him because he's in his bosom he's been in his his bosom forever you know and that's a phrase to say that he's in the bosom of the father is a phrase meaning that he is in complete and total fellowship and and uh, c connection with him and then we go to First John, First Yohanan four twelve. Another statement from him. He says, "No one has seen Elohim at any time. If we love one another, Elohim does stay in us, and His love has been perfected in us." Now again, no one has seen Elohim at any time. Now First John was probably written in about ninety A.D. or thereabouts. One of the last few books of the Scriptures to be written. Right at the end, then. So we've seen from right at the beginning in Bereshit, the first book right to the end in uh, in in the the Yohanan epistle and in the Yohanan gospel it's being stated there specifically stated that no one has seen Elohim and let me point out that John's gospel John uh, John's gospel particularly John chapter 1 and various statements in Yohanan is written it seems to have been written specifically to make clear who Yeshua was hence we have in from the first verse of chapter 1 in the beginning was the word the logos the word was with Elohim. The word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. All came to be through him, and without him, not not one, not one even came to be that came to be. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So this Yeshua, who we praise and who we worship, and who we who we believe to be the Son of Elohim, we believe, we believe to be the Moshiach, is Elohim, and that's what. That's what Yohanan is trying to point out. And he's, you know, says it in a few places in his gospel and in his letter that no one's ever seen Elohim. But of course, Yeshua himself says, I have seen Elohim. I want to I point to one more uh, scripture. This is from Shaul, from Paul. Uh, Paul says something quite, where it is, yeah. Paul says something quite lofty with regard to the Father. Paul, Muslims often point to Paul and say, ah, oh, Paul's the one who invented the, uh, the Trinity and da, da 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 Well, no, he didn't. We've seen that the, you know, the, the, the ingredients for the concept of the Trinity are all over the Torah, actually, in the Theophanies or Christophanies. But then we see here, this is, this is, this is Paul saying, talking about the, the Father. He says, uh, let's read it. In the sight of Elohim, who gives life to all, and of Messiah Yehoshua, who 
witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate. I charge you that you guard the command spotlessly blamelessly until the appearing of our master, Mashiach, which in his own seasons he shall reveal, the blessed and only ruler, the sovereign of sovereigns, the, masters of ma the master of masters, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or is able to see, to whom be respect and everlasting might, or you could say that glory and honour, amen. And the point is there that Paul is saying that the Father dwells in unapproachable light, it's possibly referring back to the imagery that we see in the Torah, in the interactions that Yahweh had with Moshe. He dwells in an unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him. No one is able to see him. So, well, what's going on? Again, all of those people who saw Elohim, who saw Yahweh, who saw the messenger, the messenger was Yehoshua. The Malak was Yehoshua. That's that's who they were seeing. So to close the video, to kind of summarize, what I'm saying is this, is that when you look at all of these appearances of, of the Most High Yahweh in the Tanakh, in the Torah in particular, you have to conclude that these people thought that they were seeing Yahweh, Elohim of the, of the patriarchs, they thought so much so that they, they thought they would die and they were terrified and they were so happy that they didn't die. And they said it over and over again. The descriptions uh, the descriptions make it clear that that Yahweh they were seeing and who was interaction with, interacting with them was also the messenger, uh, was referred to as the uh, El, as Elohim, Elohim, Yahweh, Elohim and so forth and so on. So this entity was clearly Yahweh, was God. But it wasn't the father because, as we see in some of those passages, it's made clear that no one can see, has seen or can see Yahweh, the father, God the father, because that's just how it is. But they can see, hence actually we have, going back to, um, to John, to Yohanan chapter 1, verse 17. Think about it. When he says, verse 18, sorry. When he says, no one has ever seen Elohim, the only brought forth son who is in the bosom of the father. He did declare him. He's saying that, well, it's, it's Yehoshua who has been declaring Yahweh on all those occasions. It's Yehoshua who's been making Elohim known to the people, but, you know, appearing to them and so forth. I'd probably go as far to say that it's probably, it's probably the Logos, the pre-incarnate Yeshua, the pre-incarnate Mashiach, who was walking in the garden. You know, in the cool of the day, when when um, when Adam and Hawa, you know, did their thing, and it all went it all, all went pear sh all went pear shaped. But you know, before that, they were walking, they were fellowshipping together, walking. Da -da 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 -da. In uh, you know, verse chapter three, verse eight, they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking about in the garden in the cool of the day. I mean, how chill is that? You know, they probably used to sit down and eat together. <laughs> that I think was the logos. That I think was the pre-incarnate. Uh, Mashiach there appearing and for me this is the foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity not all of these ideas about the, you know when Christians tend to apolog apologists tend to um, you know try and defend the concept of the Trinity I think they go too abstract they always jump to the New Testament first they and you know which leaves them open to the charge of well you're yeah the New Testament might have invented this but it's not in the Torah it's not in the Tanakh but it is in the Torah, it is in the Tanakh, if you're looking at these appearances. And, and again, from a Unitarian perspective, you know, people on the Restoration Fellowship and other, other YouTube channels, Anthony Buzzard and, and these guys, you're going on about this Shaliach concept and you're saying it's a very Hebraic concept. So you won't get this idea unless you, you know, unless you have a Hebraic mindset. Well, I've just read to you for, I mean, how long? 40 minutes from... Hebrew after Hebrew after Hebrew writing these things down from from Moshe to uh, to Yohanan to Shaul Paul to Hosea writing about occasions where Israelite after Israelite after Israelite has encounters with uh, with with Yahweh and thinks that it's Yahweh they're encountering uh, and they never say something like oh it's just the it's just the it's just the messenger don't worry so for me that 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 understanding doesn't hold weight unless you're going to have to argue that actually even Mos Moshe didn't understand the concept of uh, of Shaliach. So I hope that that's given you a good explanation as to why I 
you know, think that the, the concept of the Trinity is a valid biblical concept that's grounded on very clear, plain events that we see in the scriptures. Thank you for watching. I want to wish you peace and blessings. Whatever you do, make sure that you put the Most High first in your life. That's what I'm striving to do. Make sure that you pray. Make sure that you humble yourself before the Most High God. Ultimately, all of these doctrines and teachings and whatnot are worth nothing if we don't have love, if we don't walk in love and live in love. As as Yohanan said in that scripture in First John, First Yohanan, uh, if we have love for one another, then you know we are we are one with him. I think he said, "Let that be our mission in life." Um, but I hope that this video has been somewhat helpful, anyway, in your walk, in your journey. These things have been helpful to me, so I want to I want to give thanks to the Most High Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, to who appeared to the patriarchs. I want to give thanks to Yahweh for blessing me with the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you for watching. Peace, Audi Shalom.